Well, good morning. My name is Christian, and I get to serve as the location pastor here at Rock City Church in Columbus, Ohio. And I'm so excited just to get to share a little bit about God's Word today, um, share a little bit about my story, um, and then we're going to dig into Scripture in Mark 1, 1 through 8, and just see what God has to say to us today. I pray that the Holy Spirit would just speak through me in this message. Um, I'd love to open us up with prayer before we get started, though. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this opportunity. I thank you that uh, we get to come here and just share more about your word, share more about how you're moving in this city, moving in this church. Um, I ask that you would go before me. Um, let your word speak through me today. It wouldn't be my will be done, but your will be done. Um, God, just use me as your instrument as you see fit as a broken vessel today. We love you. We trust you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, well, I'll kick it off with a story about my life, kind of how my life has went um, from here uh, back to when I got saved. So I grew up in kind of a picture-perfect household uh, from the outside. From the outside looking in, everything looked like it was going well. Um, mom, dad, me, and one other brother. Uh, my brother's three years younger, and so we grew up kind of your typical brothers fighting all the time, competing in sports. Um, he's actually still in Alabama, and I'm up in Ohio, and so uh, we still keep in touch throughout the days and um, kind of going through that Going through that time growing up, we went through a, a phase where we were going to church every Sunday, every Wednesday, Sunday night. My dad was in the choir. My mom was there all the time. Uh, we just looked like we had everything together from the outside. Uh, but slowly did we know there was things going on that we truly didn't know about. So when I was 12 years old, I found out that uh, my parents were getting a divorce. Uh, my dad had cheated on my mom with another guy and is still in that relationship today. Um, but it really took, it took a toll on me. I didn't really know what biblical manhood was. I didn't, um, I didn't know what my next steps were. I started to ask these questions and like, um, what is my next step in my faith? I started to question my faith. Uh, but I did have coaches and mentors and, uh, people in my life that stepped in during that time and helped to provide clarity for me, provide vision for me. Um, and if it wasn't for that, I don't know what I would be doing today or where I would be today. But I just want to bring some clarity to this, that this lesson speaks directly to that because as we dig into Mark chapter 1, 1 through 8, it talks about how to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And as we talk about that, I just want to make it clear that um, baptism is a step that we take, a public declaration, a public declaration of faith. It doesn't make us saved. It is a step that we take post-salvation and so this was clear to me that this was the step I needed to take as I was discovering my faith and then ultimately started a relationship with Jesus. I got on this journey to take next steps in my faith. And I don't know if that's you today sitting on the other side of this camera. Maybe you're like, what is my next step in the faith? What is my next step in this journey? And I would just say, God has a next step for everyone. Maybe it's a small group. Maybe it's serving at your local church, or maybe it's water baptism. There is a next step for everyone, but I just want to go into God's Word today, and we're going to see how this journey of being baptized with the Holy Spirit brings power into our life and helps us to grow in our faith journey. And so we open up in Mark 1, 1 through 8, and in the introduction, we just see in the first verse, it says, the beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet. And before we go any further, that's the key phrase we've got to see. Our lens has to be correct on how we see God. Jesus is the Messiah. And if we see Jesus as the true Son of God and as the Messiah, it's a faith builder that we then build our faith on that foundation. And so anytime I open up scripture, I have to see the lens of who is Jesus? Who do I see God is? Who do I see that God is? And the fact is, some of us see God as sitting on his throne, shaking his fist, saying, why are you disappointing me all the time? And that's not who God is. That's not the heart of God. The heart of God is a loving heart that died while we were still sinners. He died for us. And I try to keep that perspective in mind. Every time I slip up, every time I make a mistake, I have a loving father that's still waiting with open arms and I'm never too far gone. And so I just want to speak that over you today. If you still feel that you're too far gone, you are never too far gone for the Father's love. And so as we go further, I just want to make that clear. And I have my own personal journey with that. I had my personal journey in college uh, where I didn't know what I was doing with my life. I was kind of on this journey of uh, going into engineering right out of high school. Um, all my buddies were doing it. So I was like, this is the route to go. The money was there. The pathway looked great. So I went that route, and then slowly I realized uh, this may not be God's plan for my life. He has something 
different. And I always felt this tug of what if it was something ministry related, didn't know what that was. Slowly, I realized that, oh, this is the call of ministry on my life. And I was actually in an IHOP one night, International House of Pancakes, not International House of Prayer. Um, I know it's less spiritual, but it's International House of Pancakes. I was sitting in there with some of my buddies from a college small group that I was in. And all of a sudden, I'm just praying for the meal. I didn't do anything crazy. Uh, but he, the manager comes out, comes up to me and says, hey, I need you to come back in the kitchen for a second. I need you to pray for someone. So I went back there. And I was like kind of freaked out in the moment. I went back in the kitchen. And I'm like, hey, what's up? And so he said, hey, this is Austin. Austin's been working here for quite a bit. He's homeless. He spends most of his paycheck on drugs. And we just need you to have, he needs, he needs a friend right now in this season. So I was like, hey, buddy. My name's Christian, and I'm just here to be a friend. I'm not here to judge you. I'm not here to uh, point any fingers. I'm just here to help um, help listen, lend a listening ear. And most of the times, I think that's what people are looking for. And so we sat in the back booth of IHOP for a couple weeks with a little New Testament Bible, and I just got to read scriptures. And, so, and he would ask, what's your favorite scripture? What is your favorite thing to, to study, to look at? And so I got to highlight that and invite him to church. Um, I, to this day, I don't know where Austin is or what he's doing, but I know I planted a seed, and that's all my role was in that situation. Can I plant a seed and let the Holy Spirit do the rest? And so through this passage, we're going to talk about the power that is in the Holy Spirit. And that was just a small part that I got to play in that. And so even in society today, people are taking next steps um, more really uh more than we would think, but also it's not in the ways that we would see. Gen Z is a different generation that uh, we're seeing. How do we prompt them to take next steps, whether it is water baptism or getting in a small group? Um, there's different ways that we have to appeal to um, Gen Z. That's not against God's word, but it may be something that the church has never tried. With scripture still being the authority, we have to try to engage this audience of Gen Z, this next generation, in a different way than maybe we've tried before. And so a little bit about my personal faith journey is I started in college, kind of had a relationship, but I didn't realize the call that was on my life until I realized, oh, God has so much more than trying to white knuckle my way through life. There's freedom in being able to walk with the Holy Spirit. And so this passage, I just love what it, what it captures as we go through this. And so we're going to talk a little bit about today in Mark 1, 1 through 8. I'm going to read the rest of this passage, and then we're going to dive in. Um, really to some practical things of what I think we should take away from this passage. So as we go back, Mark 1, it says, The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet. I'll send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, the whole Judean countryside, and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of those whose sandals I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And so my first practical tip I want you to take away today is every Christian should seek to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And there's actually three truths of why every Christian should seek to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And so we're going to dig into that in just a second, into those truths that we have. But the first thing that I've already hinted at is the truth is that Jesus is the Messiah, and we've got to see God through a lens of that. We have to hone in on that. And so if you look at some of the commentary that we see on Mark as we're digging into Scripture, we see that really Mark relates no stories of Jesus' birth or childhood. It launches right into Jesus' adult life and his public ministry. And so if we're trying to model our lives after Jesus' ministry— We've got to know, what did his ministry look like? He didn't start ministry really until he was 33. And so some of us, maybe we're young communicators. When we're young in ministry, sometimes we're eager to chomp at the bit, but there is time where Jesus needs to work on our hearts. He needs to mold us and shape us. And so that's what we're going to really hone in on today. And so as I was thinking through this, I was thinking, um, 
what does it look like to be water baptized and what is an example of that? And so when we see the truth is that Jesus is the Messiah, that's the first truth, that Jesus is the Messiah. And so if I'm thinking about that, I'm thinking about, well, what does water baptism represent if Jesus is the Messiah? And I thought about getting married. I've been married probably, not probably, I have been married almost three years in September, September 3rd. My wife's not here right now, but I do know our anniversary, September 3rd, uh, Labor Day weekend was our wedding um, and so we are, we are just talking about marriage and getting married. And what does the wedding band represent? The wedding band represents that I am married. It doesn't make me married. If I give this wedding band, um, and take it off, I'm still married. But when I put this wedding band on, it shows everyone else that I am married. And as I think about that, I think about water baptism. What is water baptism? When I go down and I come up, water baptism is declaring I am a follower of Jesus. I have put my faith in Jesus and I'm showing everyone else, friends and family all around me that I am a follower of Jesus. And so as I think about that, I think about, wow, there's so many people that they made the decision, but they haven't went public with it. And maybe they're Maybe they're too scared. Maybe they're ashamed. Maybe they don't know one, they don't want to go public yet. But I would just urge you, if you have felt the love of Jesus transform your life, boldly step into water baptism. Not because I'm telling you to, because Jesus set the example in his word. And we should follow that. We should follow the example of Jesus. And so continuing on, I just want you to see. I want you to see God for who he says he is. As I think about, I don't wear glasses. My wife wears glasses. But if you wear glasses, and I don't know if you've ever tried on glasses with the wrong prescription, the wrong lenses, you put them on, and everything looks blurry. You can't make out the details. You can't see clear. You can't have vision. Your vision is strained because you have the wrong prescription. You have the wrong lenses in your glasses. And so as I think about that, that's exactly how our view of God can be. If you have a healthy and correct view of who God is, clarity for your life, vision for your life, it's there and we can see it. But when we have the wrong lenses in, clarity is blurred. And so maybe that's you in the seat right now. Maybe you're in this season of, I don't know what God's plan is for my life. I don't know what the vision he has for my life. Well, my question to you is, what is your lens of God? How are you looking at God? And there's also a verse, this isn't even in my notes, but there's a verse in Mark where it talks about, and Jesus says, if you love me, you will obey my commands. And there's two ways you can read that scripture. You can say, you can look at God and shaking his hand saying, if you love me, you'll obey me and look at it like an angry God. But there's also, there is also the way of, if you love me, you'll obey me because you love me with all your heart. You will obey me out of the overflow of love for me. And that is the uh, basically the crux of what Jesus' relationship with you wants. He wants that to look like. He wants you to just fall in love with him and let everything else come out of that. And a lot of times in society, we flip that on its head and we try to white knuckle our way through life and try to say, God, I want to obey you through my will, through my efforts, through my strength. But Jesus is just like, if you'll just fall in love with me, you'll do that already. So I challenge you, if you're struggling with that and struggling with obeying his word and obeying the Bible, just fall in love with him and things become easier because you're so in love with Jesus. And we do things out of, we will obey things because we love them. Because I love my wife, I trust her word, I trust what she says, and I give her full trust. Same thing with Jesus. If we truly fall in love with him, we will obey his word. So the second truth that I would love to just impart to you is the truth is that baptism represents the repentance and forgiveness of sins. And so Mark 1, 4 through 5, it says, And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance of the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. And confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. And so we have to acknowledge, yes, Lord, I am a sinner. I've tried to do it on my own, but Lord, I'm surrendering now and I'm becoming a follower of you. 
not trying to grip my way and say, I'm going to do this out of human effort, but I am giving you control of my life, and you're the Lord of my life. You're the King of my life and the Savior of my life. And so there's actually a study done that there is bad, there are baptisms happening even at a younger age today. And sometimes it's great that we are reaching the next generation and they are going public with their faith. And I see two ends of this, but I want to just put a preface on this. As we are baptizing at a younger age, it is essential that kids and youth, they know what does this represent? Is this just a step in the process that I take or is this something that's deeper and more meaningful than that? We have to equip them with the knowledge that, yes, this is the next step for your faith, but we have to let you know that this is what baptism is. This is what this means. So I'm so glad we are reaching the next generation. As we see technology um, just ramp up in the way that kids are understanding things, I think there is a good thing on the other side of this. Children are able to make a difference. We're seeing so many young leaders in the world today, young communicators in their um, 18, 19, 20, reveal the call of ministry on their life, and they're stepping into it boldly. Yes, there needs to be wise counsel around them, but we should empower the next generation. We should call them up to greater. But we also need them to know that God's word is the foundation, and we have to understand this as our true authority. And so there's also, I want to just put an illustration of what repentance means. So repentance, a lot of people think, oh, I've got to repent, and uh, that looks some complicated word that's a churchy term. Simply repentant is a 180. I'm going this way, and I turn around, and now I'm going this way. It's a full 180. This was the life I used to live, but now I am called to a new life. I am raised from death to a new life life in Jesus Christ, and that is what baptism, the symbolism of rising up out of that water, the old is gone, the new is here, and we get to walk in that freedom. And then the last truth that I want to leave you with is that there is power in being baptized with the Holy Spirit. Mark 1, 7 through 8 says, and this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And so I don't know how many of y'all have seen the Jesus Revolution movie. Uh, we actually took some of our staff and some of our team to watch that um, when it came out in theaters. We rented out a theater, and that is just a faith builder of that movie. And as we see that movie... We truly see, I think, the heart, the heart of Jesus in that movie. I think as, as sin nature, we can get so wrapped up and step back into what the Pharisees did. They were so focused on the law that they forgot to love people. But yet we can teeter towards the other end that we're so focused on love that we throw out the law. But no, we know as believers in Jesus that Scripture is the authority, but we should love everyone as Jesus did, because he loved us while we were still sinners. So therefore, let me love like Jesus, and I want to help you grow into the best version that God has called you to be. And so as I think about water baptism, I think about even this illustration of filling up a cup with water. So think you have, you have this cup, it's got dirty water in it. You take this clean cup of water and you're pouring it in there. It doesn't automatically become clean once you pour that water in there. You've got, to get, you've got to get what is making it dirty out. You've got to get the particles and everything out of it. But slowly, over time, as that water keeps pouring in, it becomes a clean cup of water. And that is the sanctification process that we enter into. And so my belief personally is that as we grow in Jesus, we are filled with the Holy Spirit at the time of salvation. But there is still a denying of the flesh that has to happen every day. And I think a mistake many young believers make um, is that the moment we come out of that water, we just enter into a new life. Everything's easy. We've been cleansed. Nothing bad is going to happen. We're going to have no more struggles, no more bad desires. Our thoughts are clean. I wish that was the case, but there's still a work that Jesus has to do over time on the inside of us. And I didn't have this in my notes either, but I'm recently reading a book by John Mark Homer called Practicing the Way. 
And it's about being an apprentice of Jesus. It's sitting under him every day and taking inventory every day. God, how can I be cleansed? It's praying that song, Lord, search me. Search my heart for anything that's not pure or holy. And I bring it to you, Lord. And I try to pray that each day. That Lord, what is there inside me? Is it pride? Is it something of an ego? Is it something that's keeping me from seeing who you are and tapping into the power that you want to use me for? And so as we fill that cup over and over, it is constantly, because there's always outside stuff coming in. That's why I think it's so important to pray even the prayer of Ephesians of the armor of God. Lord, shield me. Whatever comes in my eyes, my ears, Lord, whatever I put my hands to, my feet to, would you protect me? Because every day something's coming in. But are you feeling more of God's word or more of the world? And I think that is the key thing. And so as, as we kind of close, I want to ask you a question. What steps can you take today towards going public with your faith? Is that water baptism? Maybe that's it. Is that just sharing your testimony with a friend, with a roommate, uh, with a coworker, with a family member? Maybe it's as simple as that. I don't know what that is for you, but I do believe that God has a next step for each of us. God has a next step for each person in their faith journey. And I believe that if, if you go all in and just say yes to God, and, and he will use a faithful yes. I'm a personal testimony of that. There's moments when I don't understand what the Holy Spirit is doing. But because I say yes and I live try to with try to live with an open hand posture, he uses it over and over and God doesn't waste anything. And so, as we continue on even leaving this today, I would just love to pray a prayer over you that maybe you haven't even made that decision. You're like, I don't even know if I can go public or get water baptized because I don't even have a relationship with God. Maybe you do know who God is, but you don't know God personally. And I love, even in scripture, it talks about truly knowing God is the Greek word of gnosko, and it's the intimate type of knowing. It's the intimate type, like a husband and wife, intimate, knowing them, being completely vulnerable with them. And that's my challenge to you, is God wants to know you truly and vulnerably. And does is that what your relationship with God looks like? If not, no shame, no guilt. God's sitting here ready with open arms, just like the prodigal son story. He's ready for you to return home and say, God, I tried it on my own, but your way is better. Your way is stronger. Your way has way better things for me than I could ever imagine for myself. So that is my challenge to you. And so maybe you, you've never even said that prayer to ask God as your Lord and Savior. And it's not the words that I'm going to say right here. It's not the words in the prayer. It's what happens inside your heart because it says in Romans that you are saved by grace. You are saved by the faith and belief in Jesus Christ. So if you would, just bow your heads. God, thank you so much for this time. Thank you for giving me this platform just to be able to share your word. Lord, I thank you for um, how you're moving in um, in Liberty University, how you're moving in Rock City, how you're moving in my life and my wife. and It's just, I'm in awe of getting to sit in your presence. But Lord, there's someone on the other side of this camera that maybe they haven't made a commitment to follow Jesus. I just ask that your Holy Spirit would move in their life. And if this is you sitting on this side asking this question of, I don't know if I, I've made him the Lord of my life. You can simply repeat after me. Lord, I accept that you are the Messiah. You are who you say you are. I believe you died and rose again three days later. I know I'm a sinner. I've tried to do it my own way, and it's just not working, Lord. But today, I confess that you are my Lord and Savior, and I commit to following you for the rest of my days. I put my full faith and trust in you. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said amen. All right, thank you so much for the, uh, just allow me to share today. I uh, hope you have a great rest of the day and we will see you next time.